Numbers chapter 35, beginning at verse 9. When you have it, say amen. If you can't find it, I believe that the scripture is going to be conveniently on our screens to the left and the right of the stage. Verse 9. The Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, designate cities of refuge to which people can flee if they have killed someone accidentally. These cities will be places of protection. Somebody say protection. From a dead person's relatives who want to avenge the death. The slayer must not be put to death before being tried by the community. Designate six cities of refuge for yourself. Three on the east side of the Jordan and three on the west in the land of Canaan. Six all together, y'all. These cities are for the protection of Israel. Foreigners living among you and traveling merchants. Anybody who accidentally kills somebody may flee there for safety. Now, drop down to verse 25. I want to give you some context here. The community must protect the slayer from the avenger and must escort the slayer back to the city of refuge to which he fled. There he must remain. Yeah, I want you to get that. There he must remain until the death of the high priest who was anointed with sacred oil. But if the slayer ever leaves the limits of the city of refuge and the avenger finds him outside the city and kills him, it will not be considered murder. The slayer should have stayed inside the city until the death of the high priest's. But after the death of the high priest, the slayer may return to his own property. Look at verse, verse 26 and 27 and 28. I want to go back to that because that's, that's really what we're going to talk about today. Where it says, if the slayer leaves the limits of the city of refuge, once you get in, you got to stay in there. And the, if the avenger finds him outside the city, it will not be considered murder. The slayer should have stayed inside the city of refuge until the death of the high priest. And I want to use a simple subject this morning, boundaries. Get you some. Somebody shout boundaries. Yeah, that's, that's, my, total, that's my total title. Boundaries get you some. Look at somebody say, yo, get you some boundaries. Get you some boundaries. It'll make sense in a minute. Father, bless your word today in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Listen, church, as a society, we, we bristle at the idea of having boundaries. Yeah, we resist the idea of living a life with limits, with laws, with rules, with boundaries. God is, and I don't know why that's strange, because even God is a God of boundaries. When he made the earth, he told the sea, the oceans, to go this far and no further. Even the ocean, as vast as it is, most of the, world, most of the earth is water, and it can very easily overflow its banks and cover the entire earth. But when God created the earth, he put the ocean out there and gave it limits where it could go no further. But yet we are people who want to live without limits, without laws, without rules. We value our freedoms at all costs. Even, check this out, even if it infringes on the rights of other people. You realize that? I want to drive 75 in a 35 mile an hour zone even if it means running over somebody's child. I want to be able to have the kind of guns I want, the kind of ammunition I want, as much as I want, and shoot wherever, even if it means endangering my children going to school. I don't want nobody to tell me what my rights are. And it's not a political thing, so don't get nervous. It's not a political church like that. But I just want to make you understand that sometimes when we insist on having what we want, we, want, we insist on it at the behest and at the sacrifice of the rights of other people. And so we don't understand it's a difficult conversation. Even in this room right now, when I said boundaries, some of y'all got tight. Because you want to hear me say freedom, liberty, no limits. Do whatever you want to do. And I got tight when I said boundaries. You couldn't even say it. I told somebody, I yell boundaries. They said boundaries. <laughs> you know why? Because we see boundaries as punishment and not protection. 
So it's a difficult conversation to have with people who were used to having excess to tell them that you have to have limits. And this world today has a spirit of lasciviousness. We want to be able to do whatever we want to do. So anytime somebody comes in and preaches about restrictions or boundaries, in particular, coming out of COVID, it's a tough conversation, Adrian, to talk about restrictions or boundaries after coming out for two years of being shut up and shut down and restricted. So for me to even teach this message, I know it's going to be a hard way to go. Look at somebody and say boundaries. Get you some. Listen, listen, even when it comes to God, it's a difficult conversation. Because the question that's often posed to me as a pastor is not what can I do to get closer to God? The question is not posed to me, what can I do to be a better Christian? What can I do to get closer, to get deeper to God? The question that's often asked me instead is how much can I get away with and still be saved? How much can I get away with and still go to heaven? How much can I get away with and still be considered a Christian or a child of God? Now, I'll be honest. It's a little bit perplexing, Charlene. I, I'm a little bit perplexed by the question. It's kind of a half full, half empty question for me because it, it would be like standing on top of a skyscraper. And instead of you asking me, how can I get closer to the center? How can I get closer to safety? You're asking me. Uh, how close to the edge can I come without falling off? <laughs> That's kind of strange to me. If you're standing on a skyscraper that says 100 stories in the air, I would think that you'd be asking me, how can I get closer to the center? How can I get further away from danger? How can I get closer to safety? But instead, you're asking me, how close to the edge can I get without falling off? People want to live as close to the edge as possible. And the problem is we don't know the edge. That's part of the problem why I can't answer that question, Daphne, because truth be told, we don't, we don't know the edge. The, the lines are blurred. And so the question becomes to you, how far is too far? How much is too much? Where are the lines? Where are the boundaries? Because when you don't know where the boundaries and the limits are, you risk being in danger. As a Christian, our desire should be to get closer to God, right? As a believer, we should be trying to desire to become more like him every day. That every day I wake up is another opportunity for me to get closer to taking on the character and the life of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament tabernacle was in three compartments. It had the outer court, the inner court, and the holiest of holies. The desire was to go from the outer extreme into the inner extreme where God dwells. So as a believer, my desire is for my walk to get so that I'm walking closer and closer to God, not hanging out on the edges. Come on, talk to me, somebody. But we live in a world where even Christians, we want to live on the edge. I want to live as close as I can to the edge of this thing. I don't want to get closer to God. We're supposed to be going from faith to faith and from glory to glory. The Bible said that the path of the righteous shines brighter and brighter to the perfect day. That means that every day as a believer, I'm getting better. I'm getting stronger. My desire is to be deeper and to be closer to the will of God versus hanging out on the edges of the will of God. I want to be in the center of God's will. How many people want to be in the center of God's will? That most people do not desire to be in the center of his will. We want to hang on the edge of God's will and tempt fate and trying to figure out how close can I get to the edge without losing my opportunities. Are you following me this morning? Somebody say boundaries. boundaries. Let me explain it this way. I was on a mission trip to South Africa with my pastor some years ago, and we traveled to a little country called uh, Swaziland. And in Swaziland, uh, they took us to this very elegant resort in the middle of Africa in Swaziland, right? We arrived at night, so I really couldn't see where we were. But in the morning, oh, my God, it was opulent. Mark, it was beautiful. It had all kinds of flowers and beautifully manicured. They had excellent service. The, 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 the professionals there, it was excellent, top-notch service. My God, it was all kind of food there, Daphne. Anything you wanted was there. I mean, it was just a it looked like a garden. It was beautiful. And all the way around this garden, they had a, what looked like to me like a 30, 40-foot wall. And so instead of me being enthralled, with this elegance and opulence, I was standing there looking at this wall. And isn't that just like us? 
to have all these things. I mean, it was food, and it was people having a good time, and it was beautiful people there, and music was playing, and I mean, it was just, it looked like a garden to me. It was like the most beautiful place I've ever been. I've ever been. But instead of me being uh, enthralled with the beauty and what was available to me, I was standing there looking at the wall. I'm a curious person. I was trying to figure out what's on the other side of this wall. Isn't that something? And finally, I asked the servant, one of the guys, I said, hey, hey, man, what's on the other side of this wall? And he says to me, Africa. What do you mean? He says, on the other side of this wall, sir, are wild beasts and dangerous animals that live and thrive and survive in the wild. And so this wall is here for your protection. Somebody's hearing me. And he must have sensed my curiosity. <laughs> so he says, sir, let, let me stop you. Anything you want is within these walls. Anything you need is within these walls. And if it's not here, we will send somebody out to get it for you and bring it back to you. But don't get curious because these walls are for your protection. Somebody's hearing me. So I started thinking about God and how God puts up boundaries for us, not as a punishment, but as protection. And some of you are like me. Instead of you enjoying all the things that God has afforded you, you are more curious about what God has restricted you from. And instead of you getting further into the will of God and enjoying all the blessings and the favor of walking with God, your curiosity is pulling you to the edge of your limits because you are distracted with what's beyond the walls. And what's beyond the walls is God protecting you from things that you can't handle. Oh, y'all, you're not going to talk to me. Write this down. Write this down. Love protects. Lo yeah, thank you. I got one amen. Love protects. Love childproofs a house and keeps certain things out of reach of small children to what? Protect them. Love will let you bring a little baby home and start putting things in the, in the uh, receptacles in the wall and moving poisons out of their reach because you love them. It's not punishment. It's protection. Love sets boundaries. Write that down too. Love sets boundaries. And to be quite honest, some of us could benefit from having more personal boundaries. That your life would be happier, more fulfilled, Ah, oh, my God, more peaceful if you set some boundaries. That some of you are like the proverbial city with no walls. And people just come in and out of your life at will because you have no boundaries there that you set for people to keep them from invading your life whenever they will. And you would be happier and have less drama in your life if you knew how to set boundaries for people and not let things just come in and come out when they want to. Look at somebody say boundaries. Some people think you're being mean, but what I'm doing is protecting my peace. See, everything can't come in and come out when it wants to. If this room had no walls, anything could come in. Anybody could come in. And some of you, you live like a house with no walls. That's why your emotions are all over the place. That's why your feelings are all easily hurt because you don't have boundaries for people. You don't have boundaries for things. Some of you are feeling stressed out on your job because you don't have enough sense to set boundaries. Oh, my God, this is going to be tough today. It's going to be tough. You don't have boundaries, and then you wonder why people overwork you and underpay you, and you're mad about it because you don't know how to set boundaries for people. You don't know how to say this far and no more. You don't know how to set boundaries for people in your life that even love you this far and no more. Don't call me after 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> if there's work to be done, catch me tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Right now, my phone is off. My ringer is off. You don't get a break from anything. You don't get a break from anybody because you allow things to just invade your life at will. Look at somebody say, boundaries. Get you some. 
down, you're stressed out, and you're angry, and you're hard to get along with, and you can't blame them. You have to blame yourself because you, my dear, have not set up any boundaries. Oh, can I go deeper? Everything needs boundaries. They need boundaries. Kids need boundaries. You're not doing your child a favor by letting them do anything they want to do. In fact, you are doing them a disservice because you have not prepared them for what the real world is like. And so what you've successfully done by giving into their tantrums is prepared them for failure in the world because they can do that with you because you're their mama, but I'm not your mama. And you can't run on the couch over here. You ever see those kids, they'd be at the restaurant, they'd be at the restaurant, and, and here they are, they throwing mashed potatoes and running across the table and running around. And what's the first thing you think? They ain't got no home training. They act out in public because they've had no rules at home. And what you have to understand is that you're not doing your child a favor by letting them do anything and everything they want to do because in the world, there are rules. There's rules to this, Smokey. <laughs> There's boundaries. There are things you can and can't do. And so when they give you instructions, so now you're mad at your boss because you want your boss to treat you like your mama. Mama said, okay, that's all right. You ain't got to go to bed. You ain't got to get up. You ain't got to clean up. Then you go to a job or you marry somebody and you want them to treat you like their mama, but you, I'm not your mama. If you're going to work in this company, there's rules. If you're going to work at this ministry, there's rules. If you're going to work at this job, there are rules. And so by you not training them at home, oh, y'all getting tight. Look, I said some boundaries. I mean, even when it comes to pets, they tell me that when you bring pets home, little puppies, that you shouldn't let them have the run of the house. That just taking a small puppy and releasing them in a 4,000 square foot house is intimidating and is scary and they can hurt themselves or they could tear up something that's really expensive. So they tell you to crate train them. Put them in a crate. In this crate. This is your space. The space is this big, but this is your space. And you know what you're doing? You're training them how to have uh, impulse control. How to hold it until it's time to go. How to hold it until you get a designated place to go. How to hold it. So all those things are being learned while you're being put into limits, into boundaries. Even pets need boundaries. Let me go here because y'all looking at me funny. Your, your marriage needs boundaries. Some of you, your marriages are in trouble because you don't have no boundaries. I'm not just talking about the, the obvious stuff like letting like no other man or woman hit on your spouse. That's obvious. I'm talking about just having boundaries with people who feel it is their right to be in your business. And your marriage is in disarray because you don't know how to set boundaries. You don't set boundaries for your in-laws. You don't set boundaries for your family. Mama, I love you. You're my darling, but this here is my house. I ain't getting, all the married people ought to say something to that. Anyway, th this here is my house. I know you're my cousin and them. I know that you're my sister, but this house has rules. It has boundaries. I put a wall around my marriage. I put a hedge around it, and you can't just come in and out when you want to. Listen, when it comes to marriage, some things are not for public consumption. You don't get to say or see everything that's in my marriage. It's not up for public consumption. And it ain't about sin either, Charlene. It ain't about being secret. It's just it's none of your business. <laughs> and we live in a world where we want to be in everybody's business. Even as a public figure, some things are not for public consumption. And some of you, your marriage would be better if you kept your girlfriend out your business. If you kept your homeboys out your business. If you kept the people on your job out your business. I understand you, my friend. When I'm ready for it to be your business, I'll share it. If I don't share it, it's none of your business. I put boundaries around it. I put limits around it. I say there are certain things that we can and certain things that we cannot do. You may not be able to call me at this time. You may not be able to come to my house when you get ready to. You may not be able to show up when you want to. You can slide in my DM whenever you... See, the internet messed us up because the internet is like the OK Corral. You can just do anything you want to do. 
And some people are so intimidated by the internet, by the internet and how accessible it is that they don't take advantage of all of the, bla- the great things that social media can do. But all you have to do is set boundaries, set limits. Your Facebook, your Instagram, your, your YouTube is set up with tools where you can limit what people can say and do to you. See, it's different, Mark. When we were young, if we wanted to talk to a certain young lady, we had to walk over to her and ask her for her number. Remember, y'all remember that? Some of y'all old enough remember that, don't you? You had to ask her for her number. And if she gave you her number, you was in there. <laughs> if it was her real number. But nowadays with the internet, they can just slide in your DM. Just slide in. You open up and somebody's in there saying, hello, beautiful. Like, who are you? <laughs> this, and now I got to deal with this person that I don't even know and they might be crazy. But you don't have to be worried about it. Just set limits. You can set boundaries. You can determine who can come in, who can be your friends, what they can see, what they can be involved in. You know those tools are to help you establish boundaries. You can't just have the whole world have access to you at any time, in any way, in any how, and just inundate your life with information and with foolishness. And suddenly, I got stuff in my eyes that I don't want to see. Some stuff I can't. I hate I saw it. Look at my say boundaries. I'm telling you, too. You got to do it. You got to set boundaries with your kids. Daphne, when my kids were small... <laughs> I taught them when this door's closed, you don't come in. That's just me. I taught them, listen, (laughs) if this door is closed, listen, unless the house is on fire or you are hurt, if you see this door closed, you got to knock before you come in. And then you got to wait until I give you permission to come in because you might walk in on something you don't want to (laughs) see. I'm trying to protect you and protect me. You having nightmares and stuff, and I'm having daymares and stuff and, and everything. I'm trying to make you a little sister up in here so you don't just. Too much, too much, too much, too much. When you don't have boundaries, sometimes you see stuff that you wish you could unsee. How many know what I'm talking about? And sometimes, too, and too much light is not good for the eyes. Yeah. Yeah, too much light is bad for the eyes and sometimes even worse for the soul. And some of us have been exposed to things that we wish we could unsee and unknow because somebody didn't provide boundaries for you. Somebody didn't tell you, and all of us can benefit from having boundaries, from having somebody who says to you, get in this house before those street lights come on. Come on, there's lions and tigers and bells and bears out there. There's predators out there. There's pedophiles out there. Get your hips in here before that street light come on. But some of us, we live in houses we didn't have no boundaries, so we're out in the streets now, and we're exposed to everything. I thank God for boundaries being set for me. How many thank God for parents that gave you a bound? Get your hips in here at 10 o'clock. You going to wear what? No. Go change your clothes and put on something else that ain't showing everything. Y'all not going to talk. I ain't getting no amens today. I thought we was past that part. Look at somebody say boundaries. Love protects. I'm not telling you to get in this house because I'm mad at you. I'm telling you to get in this house because I'm trying to protect you. No, you can't stay up till 11 o'clock at night. You're in the eighth grade. Go to bed. You got class in the morning. Well, I don't want nobody giving me no rules. Here's a simple solution. Get your own place. <laughs> when you get your own place, You can do what you want to do. You can stay up all night. But why you live in this house? This house got rules, Smokey. We got boundaries. When you don't have boundaries, you got chaos. You can't do whatever you want to do. There's other people that live here. And some of us, we're difficult now because we were difficult as kids. You don't follow instruction. You don't follow boundaries. We just ask you to do one thing. Do that one thing and do that and sit down. And when you don't follow instructions, you lose opportunities. 
Oh, I'm talking to somebody in here. For some of you right now, God wants to promote you, but you don't follow instruction. I told my son one time, go to the Walmart and come right back. He went to the Walmart. He came right back. I could trust him now with more responsibility. If he had took the car and gone to, to the mall, I would have never given him the car keys again. Why? Because I'm trying to get you to follow instruction. And what God is trying to do is teach somebody in here how to follow instruction. I'm trying to give you rules and regulations regulation so that if you be faithful over a few things I can release you to much somebody God getting ready to bless you with much give him a shout right here God get me ready sometimes it's not an issue of God getting the thing ready for you it's getting you ready for it you're not mature enough yet you're not instruction uh, catered yet you don't listen you don't pay attention so I can't release it to you but if you will follow instruction I will bless you Quite honestly, some of us, when you don't follow rules, you lose opportunity. So in our text, in our text, you with me so far? In our text, according to the Mosaic law, murder was punishable by death. However, provision was made for accidental death or manslaughter. So if you were accused of accidentally and unintentionally killing someone, you were still in danger, though, of somebody in that family seeking Revenge. That even if you kill the person unintentionally, right? I didn't mean to kill him, right? This wasn't intentional. This wasn't something I planned to do and plotted to do. Maybe we were working together. Maybe something happened. Maybe we got in a fight. Maybe something fell from a building and it killed you. It still did not take away the grief of the family because sometimes in the heat of the moment, people are not trying to figure out what really happened. You did it. I'm coming to get you. So when a person was accidentally killed, the family felt obligated, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. They felt obligated to go after the person that did the deed before they were even given a chance to go to court, right? And so, so, so what Moses did was, what God told him was to set up these cities of refuge. There were six cities of refuge. And these cities were set up and designed so that if somebody was accused, they could find a safe place until they had their day in court, so that means if I went out here and killed somebody by accident, they wouldn't catch me in the alley and kill me before I even had a chance to plead my case and to say that I did it accidentally or, I, or, I, or it wasn't me. Maybe I wasn't guilty of it. I was just accused of it. And so they were trying to come after me for murder, but I really wasn't my fault. And so they would kill you without even a court, without a jury, without anybody deliberating or debating it. And so the person who was on the run had a place to escape. Oh, thank God for a place to escape. They had a place to escape so they could hide and be safe, Carmen, until the day in court came up. You know what I'm saying? Now, now let me tell you about these cities that they set up. There were six of them. There were six cities. They were called cities of refuge. And they were accessible from anywhere. They made it easy for you. It wasn't way over here or way over there. They spread them out without, around the country so that you could be accessible from wherever you are. The roads that led to them were always kept in good repair. It wasn't bumpy and, and weeded over and, 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 and had bad roads. They were easy, paved roads that were pointing to the city of refuge. The way was always open day and night. There was no obstructions. The gates of the city were open 24-7. So that if anybody was on the run trying to get away from a accuser trying to get away from a killer they can run in there and nobody will ask any questions no questions asked you're in trouble come on in here somebody stood at the door welcoming you in so these roads were made accessible because if you were on the run from a killer you didn't want to have things all in your way and preventing you nobody it was illegal to block somebody who was trying to get to a city. It was illegal to obstruct them. And all along the way, at every crossing, they had milestones and posts that had the words refuge pointed on them. Are you following me? So what was happening is, Adrian, if I accidentally killed somebody and I was trying to get away, they made it easy for me to find safety. And so these cities represent a perfect picture of grace of the grace of God and how easy God makes his grace 
and how accessible God makes his grace and how available God makes his grace and how God will judge you if you try to stand in the way of a sinner and how God will judge you if you try to make it hard for people to get saved. I, I worry about people nowadays because some of y'all make too many rules for people. Y'all put too many obstacles in the way. You, you do too much. You go too far and you drive people away from church rather than make it easy for them to come to church. You got too many. I got to step over this. I got to step over that. And I got all this stuff. But what we should be doing is make it easy for people to find Jesus. Make it easy for people to find grace. I'm running from the streets. I'm running from the devil. I'm running from a lifestyle. I'm running from my past. And when I come to church, I need somebody welcoming me at the door saying, come on in. There's grace for you. There's a seat for you. There's space for you. And they did it not just for the Israelites, but they did it for foreigners. That means you didn't have to be my same color or same race or same creed, whoever you are and wherever you're from. Grace says, come on in. Somebody thank God for grace if, if you're glad for the grace of God. Now listen, you got to follow me here. I put your thinking caps on. The cities were set up for the innocent. For people who either accidentally killed somebody or they were accused but they weren't guilty at all. But the reason why they represent grace to me is because truth be told, when it comes to us, we were guilty as charged. That the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That the truth be told, everybody in here has come short. Everybody in here, all sin is, is it means to come short. That everybody in here has missed the mark. That everybody in here is a sinner according to the word of God. That everybody in here, there's no one perfect. No, not one. So when we're running from the enemy, truth be told, ain't nobody lying on me. That was the truth. How many people can be honest here that said, I did some stuff? That Y'all y'all not going to be honest. Let me talk to this side. How many of you can be honest and say that there was some stuff they accused me of and it was true? I'm not talking about the stuff they lied on you about. I mean, there's enough stuff that I did for real that if you brought it up, it would be the truth. I was caught red-handed, hand in the cookie jar, crumbs around my mouth. I couldn't even deny it. It was me. I should be dead. I should be dead. I should have hell. I should have destruction. But it was the grace of God that gave me a place to run. It grace. Let me tell you what this is. Grace doesn't mean I'm guiltless. Grace doesn't mean I wasn't wrong. Grace doesn't mean I'm perfect. Grace just means I'm protected. Is there anybody in here that's glad that you're protected? See, this is the goody tutsu church in here. I want to find the real raw, ragged folks in here who did some stuff. You knew about the stuff you knew about, but you should have knew about the stuff you didn't know about. And the stuff you just sit, shake your head and say, mm, mm, mm. Mm, mm, mm. Are there any people like that in here who could be honest and say, I shouldn't even have the house that I have. I shouldn't even be able to look as good as I do. If you knew what I came out of, I shouldn't even have the job that I have, the peace that I have, the favor that I have. And the only reason I have it is because of God's grace. Somebody give God a shout for his grace. It was grace that took me out of the pit. It was grace that forgave my sins. It was grace that helped me to get myself together. It was grace that pulled me out of nonsense. It was grace. I wasn't so special. I wasn't so good. I ran with the raggedy people. I did some dirt, but grace covered me. Is there anybody know that grace covered you? Oh, you ain't. You ain't. Somebody said amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was bound, but now I'm free. Give God praise for grace in here. They had signs, Daphne. When I was running away from sin, they had signs that say grace this way. I'm so glad when I stumbled into a little storefront church one day that there wasn't somebody at the door saying, you can't come in here. You got to get dressed a certain way. You got to fix your hair a certain way. You got to be a certain color. But they opened the door and let me come right on in and fall on my knees. And there I found the grace of God. Somebody give God praise for the grace of God. 
That's why we need a church. Not to go to some air-conditioned building to fill up our day on a Sunday. We need a church because there's somebody right now who is wrestling with things, who is running from things, and they need the grace of God, and they have to find a place where there's some welcoming people who say, come on in and look, and say, look, I was just like you. See, the saints don't forgot. We all cute now. We got our fancy shoes on and our red bottoms and our fancy cars, and we don't forgot what God brought us out of. But somebody that didn't forget and your memory is not that short, would you take 30 seconds right here and thank God if he brought you out of anything? If he brought you out of anything, give God 30 seconds right here of your best praise. Lord, I thank you for your Y'all ain't getting it yet. Y'all ain't getting it yet. You ain't getting it yet. Look at somebody say, it was grace that brought me here. It was grace that brought me here. See, see, Mark, let me be honest with you. Truth be told, sometimes it was a close call. I want to talk to some people in here. I know you made it in, but it was a close call. Oh, baby. Oh, ba 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 baby. It was close. I was right there with him. He got arrested. I got away. It was a close call. I want to talk to somebody right now who went to get a blood test and it came back negative, but it was a close call. Never mind. Never mind. Y'all not going to be real today. Y'all want to be cute. Y'all want to be cute church today. But I want to talk to some people that to be honest and say it was a close call. It's not that I didn't do it. I just didn't get caught in it. It was a close call. I, they, they were shooting at the club and it got them, but it didn't get me. But it was a close call. Come on, somebody. And so people bother me when we talk about grace and you don't get happy. You don't know how close you was to the edge. You don't know how you were so close. One push would have pushed you over. One push and you would have ended up in destruction. One push and you would have been in jail. One push and you would have AIDS. One push and you'd be pushing a cart around, losing your mind. But the grace of God pulled you back from the edge. Is there anybody? You know what, in baseball, in baseball, when you're running into home base and you slide in, you know, you slide in, sometimes the play is so close, it's so close that, that they can't tell from the stands if you're out or not. So the umpire stands over top of the plate and says, safe. This is why I don't care what people say. Because while you're judging me, while you're talking about me, while you're saying what I'm not, while you're saying I'm a dog, God is standing on top of me saying, safe. Yeah, I've been through some stuff, and I did some dirt, and I should be dead. But God stands over me as my umpire and says, is there anybody that's glad that you are? I'm safe in the arms of Jesus. It was tough. It was a close call, Daphne. You're still talking about my clothes, and you're still talking about my hair, and you're still talking about your still smiggering smoke on me. But thank God I'm Slap somebody and say, I'm safe. I'm safe. I'm safe. I'm safe. I'm safe. What the devil thought he had me, but I got away. I'm so glad. And the devil's mad because he missed the soul that he thought he had. Somebody jump up on your feet and give God praise because you are. I'm safe. I'm safe. I'm safe. I'm safe. I'm safe, Charlene. Devil, you should have got me when I was still in the club. You should have got me when I still had a needle in my arm. You should have got me when I still had a fifth in my pocket. You should have got me before I figured out who I was. You should have got me before I thought I wanted something else. But thank God, I'm... Find three people and say, I'm safe. I'm safe. I'm safe. I'm not over here struggling. I'm not on the edge no more. God has called the play. When the umpire says safe, it's uncontested. You can't get mad about it. You can't fuss about it. He's.
Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. See, the reason why some people really don't get it is because you really don't know how close you were. You really don't know how close to the edge you came. And so it's hard for us to really give God a real praise because you thought you were standing when you wasn't. You were like me standing up there complaining about the wall and didn't know on the other side of the wall you was just about a cinder block away from being snatched away by a beast with no mercy. You were just one phone call away from being a drug addict running around here without your mind. You were just a second away from somebody taking your life. But grace. <laughs> Listen, I say grace. But let me warn you here, beloved. We should not take the grace of God for granted. You made it in. You made it. But you should not take the grace of God for granted, because even grace has limits. We've been taught that grace means we can do anything we want. We've been taught incorrectly. We've been taught that grace means you can do anything you want and still be okay. So now I'm a Christian. I'm living on the edge, and I can do anything I want because grace got me covered. And so now the lines are blurred, and so I'm professing to be a Christian, but I get to do anything I want, but it's all right because grace covered me. We've been taught incorrectly, but grace has limits. Somebody say grace has limits. I want you to remember the angels who left their first estate, who were kicked out of heaven and are now bound in chains, waiting to be destroyed because they disrespected grace. I'm going to talk to you about the people who ignored Noah's warning, who said it don't take all that, who said, oh, that's not necessary. And only eight souls were saved when they closed the doors because they took the grace. It was 120 years he was preaching. For 120 years he preached, it's going to rain, it's going to rain, it's going to rain. And I hear somebody say, don't take all that. You ain't got to go to church every Sunday. You ain't got to pray. You don't have to study. You ain't got to be a Christian. You ain't got to live that strictly. But when the doors closed, only eight souls were saved. I want to remind you of the children of Israel who came, ooh, out of Egypt, out of bondage, but never fully went into promise because they took the grace of God for granted. And many of us who just feel like I just got it like that, I want to just warn you that he that thinks he stand, take heed lest he fall. You cannot take the grace of God for granted. Y'all ain't shouting today. How shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. You can't be so 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 let me get my first my first my first my first point here. Number one. Number one, I want to talk to you about the struggle. The struggle is this. The struggle with all of us is we want to stay where we are and still be protected. But the rule was you had to relocate. Wherever you lived, you had to leave your home and go to this city. You know what I'm saying? You had to get out from where you are and go to another place in order for you to be protected. If you didn't go to the city, you couldn't be protected. So what happens with us, here's the struggle. We want to be who we were and who we are at the same time. That's the struggle. The struggle is I want to be a Christian, but I want to still do what I want to do. <laughs> I just stole everybody's joy now. We was shouting. Hit that organ for him real fast. We was shouting. But the struggle is I still, I want to be a Christian, but I still want to smoke weed. Ooh, I'm sorry. I want to be a saved Christian woman, but I still want to sleep around. Ooh, I'm sorry. I want to be a pastor, but I still want to get my groove on. Oh, I'm sorry. But because in order for me to be protected, I got to leave where I am to get where I'm going. And how many know that you got a devil after you? So here's how we do, Mark. When the way is open, we meander to the city. 
I'll get there one day, Pastor. One day I'm going to serve the Lord. One day I'm going to get my life right. And there you are, meandering, taking your time, strolling to the city of refuge. And how many know when you got an enemy after you, you got to get in a hurry? You got to get in a hurry. You got to get up and you got to get going. Because you got a devil that's trying to kill you. And it reminds me of the Bible that says that the enemy walks around, the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, trying to find you slipping. That you can't be who you were. So that means you have to abandon whatever lifestyle you're in, and you got to move fast. Look at somebody say, move fast. Make decisions. Start moving stuff around. If God has given you grace, to get out of a situation, you can't keep hanging around it lest you get back in it. Oh, God, is this, is this too much for Sunday morning? If God has liberated you and opened the door, you got to help him get your stuff and get out of there. You want to negotiate with it and meander around, and I'll get around to it. I got time. Young people saying, I got time. I'm only 22. I got time. Somebody saying, I got time to get through it. It's, it's only 2022. 20, I got till the end of the year. No, you got to move quick, and you got to move fast. And the struggle is that you want the deliverance, but you don't want to leave where you are. And some of you right now are in a situation where God said, the grace, the door of grace is open. But you're about to become a victim of your own decisions. Look at somebody say, get in a hurry. Get in a hurry. Get, rather than hanging on the edge, get in a hurry. Number two, I'm going to talk about the standing. Because here's the issue. Once you got in the city, the stipulation, Sister Darlene, is that you had to stay. You had to stay there. You couldn't be in and out. You had to stay. Once you moved in, you had to stay there. You had to stay there because you got an enemy that's waiting on you. And so in my mind, I picture people walking around that wall, waiting to catch you slipping, waiting to catch you outside. You safe inside, but the enemy's still out there, and he's pacing back and forth. Because the way it worked, Daphne, if they caught you outside, it was going to be on site. Yeah, don't let me catch you outside. If I catch you outside, it's going to be on sight. I'm telling you right now, you killed my brother, you killed my sister. It ain't like you good or nothing like that. It ain't like I forgot. I'm just trying to catch you slipping. And so for some people, you want to put your left foot in and your left foot out and your left foot in and shake it all about and do the hokey pokey. That's what you want to do. You, you want to step out when you want to and step back real fast and the enemy's waiting to catch you slipping. He's waiting to catch you unawares. He's waiting to catch you on one of those times that you decide you're going to stick your foot out there. Because if they catch you outside, they could kill you, Charlene, and murder you, and there'd be no repercussions. Why? Because you should have stayed in. Y'all don't want to hear about no boundaries. I'm sorry. Look at somebody say, boundaries. Get you some. You're like me standing in the wall in Africa. I got all this stuff available to me. Why would I want to be on the other side of this wall? I already know what's out there. And for some of you that have been out there for a long time, you already know what's out there. You already know. I'm not talking about some of you church babies that grew up in church and you're curious. I'm talking about some of you, you've lived enough life that you already know what's out there. God gave you enough grace to stick your foot in it, to go out there and see and sample it. And you already know there's nothing to it. But the enemy keeps trying to get you to play. I mean, let me play. Let me play over here and play back and play. So, but if you're going to be in, you got to stay. You got to stay. Pastor, I'm in. I just want to be on the edge. Where is the edge? Where is the edge? I know where the edge is. No, you don't. The Bible talks about this in one scripture. It talks about every one of us is drawn away by our own lust. Let no man say he's tempted by God. But every one of us is drawn away by his own lust. What happens is when we start playing patty cake with the devil. And while you patty cake, he's drawing you out there further. He's drawing you out there further. He's making you think I'm your friend. 
but he's drawing you out there further. Because he knows that as long as you're in grace, let me tell you how good grace is. Grace is so good, they can't bring up your past. You're so covered by the blood of Jesus, they can't go back and get something you did in 1982 and bring it up. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. You can't go back to something I did in 10th grade and bring it up. That when God deals with you, he deals with you through the blood of his son. And all he sees is a righteous person, not because you're right, but because you're covered. But the enemy can't go back. God says, I took all your sins, your faults, and I threw it in the sea of forgetfulness. But the enemy tried to go back and get it and bring it up. That's why you can't fool with people that always want to bring up your past. If God ain't talking about it, why are you talking about it? Y'all ain't happy in here. Yeah, so, but but you got to stay in grace. Look at somebody say, get away from the fence. This is how some of y'all are. Y'all in grace, but you like this on the fence. <laughs> you just <laughs> hanging on over there looking. What y'all doing over there? You know what they doing over there. <laughs> you already know. You got to go back twice to see. It ain't changed. These kids tickle me. Because when they discover a new dance, a new drug, a new whatever, they act like it ain't never been discovered before. But I was like, boy, they did that 20 years ago. It's new to you, but it ain't new. Ain't nothing new under the sun. So when they come out with stuff, here they are 14, 15 years old. Pops, you ain't never seen this. Yes, I did. How you think you got here? You know, <laughs> they always think they, kids act like they discovered sin. We discovered sin. We made, sin was here before you got here. It was here when my grandma was here. So you already know what it is. But tell somebody to stay in place. Stay in the city. Stay in grace. Stop trying to play with it as if you have all the room in the world. Look, somebody said, get away from the fence. Last thing. Last thing. I want to talk about the state. This is important. Because when they ran into the city of refuge, as long as the high priest was alive, they was covered. As long as he was alive, they was covered. That means that as long as he was alive, the high priest's job was to pray for you, right? Not just for you, but for the whole nation. That was his job. The high priest was to offer sins, uh, offer up offerings for the sins of the people. If they did wrong, if they got out of will of God, if they were in the city, they had to just offer an offering that the priest could pray on their behalf and God would give them mercy. How many say, thank God for mercy? That was his job. As long as he was alive, he was covered. But check it out. While he was in the city, his kids were covered. His property was covered. His wife was covered. Could nobody come, Carmen, and claim his property while he was in the city? As long as he was in the city, the high priest said, don't touch his stuff. Don't touch. You cannot touch his stuff. I want to say to somebody that Jesus is our high priest. He is our intercessor. The Bible says he ever lives to make intercession for us. That Jesus is not like the high priest of old who would die and pass away, but Jesus ever lives. That means that my whole family is covered. He's praying for everything that pertains to me. The priest, as long as he was alive, they were covered. But at some point, they had to die. But listen, Jesus ever lives. You ain't happy about that. The only reason you have what you have is because Jesus has been praying for you. Jesus has offered up prayers for you. My prayers are good, but his prayers are way better, and he's ever living. He don't sleep. He don't get tired. He don't get sick of it. He don't go on vacation. He's always praying for you. He's praying that you keep your job. He's praying that you keep good health. He's praying over your kids. Even when you don't have enough sense to pray over your kids, Jesus is praying for your kids. Oh, my God, I wish somebody was happy about the intercessor, about the high priest who is praying. Pray for me. I'm covered. I'm covered by his prayers. Let me tell you how good his prayers are. Sometimes he's praying for me even when I'm not praying for myself. Come on, somebody. That sometimes he's looking out for me when I'm, not, look, when I'm not looking out for myself. That he never sleeps and he never slumbers and he's always on the case. Somebody give God praise for a high priest. 
he ever lives. Let me close with this. I, I, I quoted a scripture a while ago. I said, I said, how shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Can I be honest and transparent for just a moment? Truth be told, God has been like a no trespassing zone in my life. A no trespassing sign in my life. If I'm going to be completely honest, maybe not you, but me. And there were some things that I didn't get to do because God forbid it. There were some things that I couldn't get into, not because I didn't want to, God forbid it. That there were some things and some people who never crossed my path because God forbid it. Now, I know you're a super strong Christian, and you, you got a big S on your chest, and nothing gets to you. But I'll be honest about me. There were some things that God knew that if this came across my path, I'd be in trouble. So rather than let it cross my path, God said, God forbid it. Y'all not going to be honest. That when you think about the things that would have happened, should have happened, and could have happened, it was God who prevented it from happening. Sometimes I was in the right place, but God still shut it down. That you ought to be glad for the people that God shut down in your life. Certain people that God pulled out of your life because he knew as long as they were there, you were going to be good. And you didn't have to get rid of them. God got rid of them. Come on, somebody. God knew if you took that job, you'd be in bad shape. God knew if you married that person, you'd be in bad shape. How many thank God that you didn't get who you thought you wanted? Y'all ain't going to get happy. I know you sitting next to who you buried to, and you can't admit it. But, but for the rest of us who can look back and say, God, I'm so glad I did not. I'm glad you shut that down. I cried when they left. I did. I had a hard time. I was begging them to stay. But when I look back now, I'm glad that God forbid. God shut it down. God moved them away. God didn't let me get the job I wanted, the place I wanted, the people I wanted, because God had something better for me. Somebody thank God for better. You ain't thanking him for better. Somebody thank God for better. God forbid it. Hey, yeah, somebody get it now. Thank you, Lord. You stood there like a sentinel and wouldn't let certain stuff touch me. See, you brag because you're really strong, but I'm bragging because God, because he's really strong. That some things just didn't get to me because God was standing there shielding me from it. Can't touch him. The Bible talks about this. The Bible talks about how, let me tell you how powerful God is. The Bible talks about how the spirit of iniquity is already at work in the earth. That the Antichrist is really already here, y'all. He's just waiting to be revealed. He's not coming. Understand me. All the things that you're seeing in the end time is prophecy being fulfilled. Wars and rumors of wars. Pestilence, diseases. Come on, y'all. Viruses that we can't explain. Earthquakes in diverse places. We're having earthquakes in places that we don't normally have earthquakes. Come on, somebody. All of this is Jesus is fulfilling Jesus' prophecy that all these will be the signs of the end time. And you're waiting for somebody to send you a, 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 a ticker on CNN and say, we've identified the Antichrist. He's already here. The spirit of iniquity, his influence is already operating in the earth. That's why you see the unrest. That's why you see the racial tensions. That's why you see the things that are happening. That's why you're seeing people turning away from God in numbers, in droves. That's why you're seeing people being given over to sorcery. And sorcery in the Bible came from the word apothecary, where we get, where we get medicine, drugs. All these things are happening because the spirit of iniquity is already working. And if it wasn't for God holding him back... Y'all not hearing me. Where are my Bible students at? The only reason that the enemy has not taken over completely is because God said, hold up. Wait a minute. I got to get my son through here. I got to get my daughter through here. I got to get my souls out of this. There's somebody that needs me. It's going to be a moment when I let him go. But right now, he's holding it back. He's holding back the spirit of iniquity. That's why they can't kill you, because God's holding them back. That's why they can't shut you down, because God's holding them back. That's why you can't get the best of you. That's why you can't be overtaken. Where are my overcomers out in here? Jump on your feet and say, I'm an overcomer. 
He's holding it back. He's holding it back. He's holding it back. Everything the devil tried to do, God is shutting it down. No weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper because God is shutting stuff down. And I see God shutting some stuff down. I see some arrows being pointed at you. But God said, I'm shutting it down. Find about three people and slap them and say, God, shut them down. Shut them down. Shut them down. Shut them down. The lie ain't going to work. The rumor ain't going to work. What they said against you ain't going to work. What they set up ain't going to work. What they designed ain't going to work. Because God said, I'm shutting them down. He's in my grace. She's in my grace. She's covered. You ain't happy. She's covered. Whatever the devil tried to do, it ain't going to work. Tell somebody. It ain't going to work. You might try it, but it ain't going to work. You might throw it, but it ain't going to work. God. Okay, I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. Somebody hear what I'm saying. Go slap somebody and say, it ain't going to work. Stop worrying about it. Stop stressing about it. Stop walking the floor. It ain't going to work. They might try it. But it ain't going to work. Somebody give him praise right here. Somebody give him praise for boundaries. Somebody give him praise for boundaries. Somebody give him praise for boundaries. Listen, Daphne. I'm going to tell you why I'm getting happy. Because the same wall that kept me in kept the wild animals out. I'm so glad that God put a wall in front of me. It didn't let me out, but it didn't let you in. That's why every chance I get, I give God a shout with my weak self. I may be weak, but I'm safe. I may be struggling, but I'm safe. I may have made mistakes, but I'm safe. I may have fell on my face, but I'm safe. At least I'm inside, and he didn't turn me outside. As long as I'm inside, he can work on me. He can deal with me. He can build me. Somebody thank God for his amazing I said, thank you for his amazing grace. You know why it's amazing? Because when I start counting up all the things I did, there's no way I should even be alive. But look at God who gave me time. You ain't happy yet. You ain't happy yet. He gave me time. I should have died in jail, but he gave me time. I should have had AIDS, but he gave me time. I should have lost my mind, but he gave me time. Ah. Somebody thank him. Somebody thank him. Somebody thank him. Somebody thank him. Somebody, somebody thank him. It's amazing grace. I don't even understand it. I don't even know how it works. Slap somebody and say, it's amazing. All the stuff God brought you out of, I shouldn't have to say anything else. I can go on home. All you got to do is think about the things God brought you out of. And I feel like singing that song when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me. My soul cries out, hallelujah. Thank God for saving me. Thank God for saving me. God for saving me. Thank God for saving me. Is there anybody glad that God saved you? 
I wish I had somebody who felt like having church. I wish I had somebody who was glad he's...